So hello everyone, welcome to today's lecture. Thank you very much Vina, for that really nice introduction. Thank you for inviting me to do this lecture. I'm very excited to be with uh, you today. Uh, so the main theme of today's lecture is practicing. I am sure that most of us, well, all of us are very familiar with practicing as a concept as well as studying. Um, some of us love it, some of us are maybe not as excited about it. Uh, in any case, we all have different experiences when it comes to practicing. So in this, let's say an hour or so, I will just try to explain some of the things that go into practicing guitar, specifically as an instrument, and how to simply build uh, a program and how to work on new pieces. So, and uh, also I want to stress this one more time, uh, you really don't need a guitar. Uh, I'm going to show all of these examples myself and also uh, we are going to publish this later online so you have plenty of time to go through these exercises yourself. There's really nothing to worry about. Life is stressful enough, right? Uh, so just enjoy and we'll, like I said before, learn something together. So I'm a concert artist, a concert guitarist, and uh, one of the main questions people ask me is, how do you live like that? That's number one. And uh, yeah, I manage, but then the follow-up question to that is usually how much do you practice daily or weekly? And I don't know, I change my answer every time because I don't really think it's that important. So I say, I don't know, I practice six hours a day, you know, I practice eight hours. Uh, I uh, don't really care much about these type of questions, you know, how much. I understand that numbers are very comforting to people, but I found that through many years of experience that it kind of takes a bit more than just, you know, hours. Uh, in practice, it's mostly how do you practice? So that's the main question of today's lecture. Not how much, but just how to practice, you know. Um, and I spent a lot of time working this out, especially when I was a high school student. And later I will share with you some of my specifically high school experiences. Um, and I found out that there is really no unfortunately, no secret formula. Uh, but there are a couple of tips and tricks that we can use in our everyday work. So in this lecture, uh, after this very brief intro, uh, I will go with you through some of the technical exercises that I go through every day. That would be part one. And in part two, I will show uh, like a specific example of what it means to work on a new piece. And that's why I sent you the uh, YouTube link for my performance of Rosita and it's sheet music. I hope that you all have it and you've uh, gone through it. Uh, and also uh, in the end of the lecture, I will just um, give you a couple of tips on how to connect practicing with studying which I found actually um, quite useful. And just some simple advice on how to, you know, maintain focus and motivation, you know, when things are a bit challenging. Um, so first of all, again, I'd like to thank you for being here. It's um, for me already a great sign that you want to learn something and that really is number one. Uh, so, when playing an instrument, uh, it's really not as, I can hear someone, we can just, mm -hmm. <laughs> please, my microphone's on mute, it's, it hurts a little bit. Uh, so, yeah, uh, 
Where was I? Yes. Okay, so simply how to start your practice day. I know that all of us, but most of us don't really have enough time to dedicate most of it to practicing guitar. So, and believe me, I understand. Later you'll see why and how much I really understand. Uh, so I devised a very simple formula, which is applicable to really everyday practicing. So we are playing with left and right hand, regardless of what some other instrumentalists think. For example, pianists, they tell me, oh, you play with one hand. Yeah, which one? Uh, so I uh, think it's really important to keep that in mind. And we are playing with two different hands, and then we have to connect them. So that's why I always like to start my day with a couple of very simple left hand exercises and right hand. And then I combine them with scales. One important advice here is to alternate between left and right hand exercises. Why? Because I found out that it's really the best way to keep things interesting. I'm just reaching for my guitar. Uh, really a nice way to keep things interesting so it's not you know boring you're doing just one exercise for 20 minutes uh, and it also gives you plenty of time to think about what you're doing and probably most importantly it prevents injuries because you are not putting too much stress on one hand at a time because you're alternating uh, important thing about technical exercises is they have to fulfill three criteria for me at least, but I think for a lot of people as well. Uh, they need to be simple. Simple doesn't really necessarily mean easy. I know that some of these, um, even though they are <laughs> simple, are definitely not easy, so I understand that. But they need to be simple, nothing too complicated, no, you know, broken science. They need to be simple, they need to be repetitive, which means that you should be able to create a loop out of it and then third they need to be useful and they need to be useful for you that means something that might work for me might not work for you but even though you will be the judge of that i found out that it does take at least a week to find out what works best for you so you also have to give it some time you know it might not work out the first couple of days but by the weekend you will be happy that you've done this exercise. Okay, so before we start, we always make sure that we we are in tune. I'm using a standard tuning for the first part of the lecture. And let's start again with very simple left-hand exercises. Um, for my exercises, I like to start in a position which means that I'm doing a one, two, three, four. If you, I think you can see it. I adjusted the camera so it's kind of uh, left hand friendly. Uh, one, two, three, four in a position, nothing extended, nothing contracted, nothing crazy going on. Just one position on one string. Uh, I'm playing just with my thumb. I know you, can, you cannot see it. I'm again keeping it very simple with the right hand fingering just so you can focus on the left hand. So for beginners level, we would just go chromatically one fret at a time in a position. do all of that would just increase the tempo a little bit so just okay so I think we can all agree it's, it's very simple very simple fingering and repetitive goes up and down up and down straight forward and trust me even though you might not think of much of it, it's extremely useful. I do stuff like this 
every day, even though I'm 32 years old, well, 33, and I've been playing guitar for a while now, uh, I still do some of these, let's say, basic beginner's exercises almost every day. They are the most useful of them all. The only thing is that you need to keep an eye on is to really keep the position. Let's not go crazy with our fingers. Minimal movement. Minimal movement and also try to do those two famous things. I think all of our teachers told us this when we were younger, that the finger should be right next to the fret, not on it, not here, because we all know what happens here. Uh, so keep it like this and also keep it perpendicular to the fretboard. So it shouldn't be, well, it shouldn't be like mathematically exactly 90 degrees, but it should be very close to it. So not like this and not like this. It's simply um, physics, you know, what works best. Uh, I think repetitiveness is the most important thing with this exercise because it allows you plenty of time and space to work on what you need to work on, what you find most difficult. So for the intermediate level, I would like to add slurs so that you alternate between playing everything with the right hand, just playing two notes at a time with the right hand. So I'm just gonna do and exaggerate this form with my thumb so you can see what I'm doing. So. to emphasize that it should be in tempo. Doesn't have to be too slow, not too fast, but in a tempo. Let's not go faster as we go along or slower when it becomes more difficult. No, you need to keep it steady. That's um, why it is a bit more difficult. And volume level should be relatively even throughout the exercise. So nothing, no crazy accents. We can do that like in a separate exercise, but for now, even or as even as possible. It's it's an exercise, of course. We are not gonna play exactly like this um, when we play a specific piece of music. The point of these technical exercises is that they prepare us for what we have to do. We don't have to think about every single thing. Ultimately. With all of these exercises I'm going to show you, the point is that it, they turn into autopilot mode. So that after a while, you don't even have to think about it. They just happen, you know. So this, uh, I wanted to just here uh, mention that these are just two possible combinations. We have uh, four more, of course, because we have four different fingers. So you can just see what I'm doing here. I'm gonna do the beginner's exercise just so you can see the finger pattern. So it's one, two, three, four. But of course, that's also, uh, there's also one, three, two, four. And of course, one, four, two, three. So you basically do this. And I would suggest that you do this in many different positions. I'll just readjust my camera a little bit. Uh, so you do this in many different positions to so get familiar with the whole fretboard. So for example, or with the one, two, uh, one, four, two, three. Set for the intermediate level, something like that. Like I said, pick your own tempo, it's totally up to you, but try to make it as even and steady as possible. You 
know, I think in those conditions, uh, they will work the best, these exercises. Otherwise, you know, m might not work out. <laughs> Uh, so just keep that in mind. Also, I would like to do the opposite movements. So these were ascending movements and ascending slurs. Uh, I would also like to incorporate some descending movements because we're also going both directions when we play. So something like For example, four, two, three, one. So I do stuff like this really every day, even though, like I said, it's beginners or let's say intermediate level, because they are so simple, they are so effective, and they really, all of these exercises kind of, uh, they actually put me in a good mood. I don't find them. Uh, tedious or boring, they're actually a really nice way to uh, kickstart your day, really, trust me. When it comes to that, I also mentioned the third level, which is kind of advanced. This depends on how much you want to torture yourself, so you can play this, for example. gaming like nightmare level. Uh, I've been doing this for a while now, so I'm used to it. And these are actually brilliant exercises, but please, and I'm begging you, uh, really go through them only once you are really familiar with the position and these previous two sets of exercises. Otherwise, you know, you might actually hurt yourself uh, because they require quite a lot of stamina and discipline. And they're actually quite... When you don't really do that properly, they can actually become torture, so be careful with that. I'm just saying that with every single one of these exercises, there are levels. And you can always find ways to kind of upgrade or even create your own exercises, which is uh, one of my main advices for today, is that regardless of these examples that I give you, always try to find ways to create uh, your own exercises. Now, it doesn't matter if that exercise already exists. That's not the point. The point is that you created it somehow. It was a product of your imagination, of your thinking process. And I think that's extremely important when we are trying to work out something new. It's uh, very similar to language learning. Uh, when we are trying to acquire a new language, it's always good to, um, you know, come up with certain things yourselves. And after a while, you actually find yourself thinking in that foreign language. It's really an amazing feeling, and I promise you this will happen uh, with these exercises as well. It, it already hasn't happened. Um, today's lecture is mostly based on left hand. That's why I positioned my camera like this, so you can see it more clearly, but I'm just gonna show you a couple of examples for the right hand as well. So what I like to do uh, on my, like, let's say, three levels of difficulty when I'm doing right hand exercises, first of all, I absolutely do not use my left hand when I practice right hand. It's completely unnecessary. Uh, if you want to do it any way, fine, that's your choice. I don't use it. So I basically use it to support the instrument physically. It, but, you know, I might as well drink it with some coffee while I'm doing it. I think it's only this hand. I do exercises with a single finger, thumb, I, and A. 
I also do uh, exercises where I'm doing practicing different intervals and uh, so combination of two fingers and I'm also doing some exercises where I'm using three or more fingers because that's all that uh, that's what we do as classical guitarists uh, we use fingers we don't have a pick uh, so we have to really make sure that all of them work maybe not this one you know this can be like a hobby finger uh, but these four uh, I am made should be utilized quite frequently. So with one finger exercises, I just, okay, uh, I just kind of go up and down. So this is just up and down in, let's say, quarter notes, the most simple combination. And then you will find that there may be some other combination that's possible. Let's say skip, play every other string. Or maybe you can, uh, sorry, I'm busy. Uh, you can use some rhythmic uh, variations, for example, if you find this, you know, a bit too even to worry some. Syncopated rhythm. The point of this is to see how your hand, of course, you're not going to play like this, this is a crazy position, but so you can just uh, see, uh, see it more clearly in your camera. Um, the thing is that you just uh, have to see how your hand reacts to different positions. Of course, you're not always going to use your eye finger on the first string. Sometimes you will have to use it in your sixth string. It's just how life works. Uh, so these exercises, that they help us to get used to these somewhat unusual positions. And I would do the same thing in my second group with intervals. <clears throat> So interval is just a relationship between two pitches, not necessarily even two different pitches, just two notes. So we have, for example, with a P M, for example, um, with a string in between. And then for the third group, you can use three or more fingers because that's, that's already a chord. So chord is anything that involves three or more pitches. I would emphasize that we should use it simultaneously. You know, so no arpeggios right now, just. And just listen to what you're playing and how your fingers react, how it feels. some advanced level can use thumb to strike two or more strings. So, or, you know, because I'm sorry, you know, it's not my fault. You're going to encounter this many times in whatever you play. So it's best to kind of practice it before so you have those tools, that's those, that set of tools that you can use uh, in your everyday practice. Uh, also, after all of this, you can kind of divide these exercises into arpeggio type of structures. So arpeggio is basically a chord which is not played simultaneously but successively. It usually goes from low to high, right? But it quite often goes from high to low in our uh, case. I found this is a great place to practice three stroke versus rest stroke. I know that's quite a controversial topic, but here we go. So a rest stroke basically means that your finger is literally resting on the adjacent string after it struck, strikes its original position. So I will just start with the most simple uh, thumb exercises. Just rest. And then maybe use I finger 
where the downward movement, so from high to low. Now, I think that a lot of people will uh, maybe think that this is crazy. Well, I would agree completely because this is something that we use quite frequently in, let's say, Spanish repertoire, especially 20th century repertoire, it's this. Right. Fun fact, I literally couldn't play this when I was, you know, a student. I wasn't even that young at that uh, point. I just couldn't play it. Why? Because I didn't practice it. So after, I, I think a week, but I think it was even less than that, I could actually play arpeggios in all positions. Just by spending like literally two minutes just going through the movements, but like actually thinking about what I'm playing and then readjusting my hand accordingly. So while before I was playing something like, like, like this, after five days it was, it was really this, I'm not, you cannot make stuff like this up. I also have recordings of me playing this, with, playing it quite poorly. Um, similar thing happened with tremolo as well, but we'll leave it for, you know, maybe some of our future lectures, you know, uh, because there's already quite a lot to do. So uh, when we are done with this left and right hand, I would just like to emphasize one more time, alternate between left hand and right hand exercises, please, if possible. So, for example, uh, I'm doing beginner's level exercises, so couple of minutes of this, couple of minutes, not hours, important to not uh, stress, minutes, followed by a one minute break, but like an actual break, not uh, whatever, and then downward movement, descending slurs. intervals and simple chords, open strings, no left hand, just with intervals, so these are fourths and thirds, or and then third group of left hand exercises is something that connects both movements. So triplets, for example, crazy that day. So this followed by arpeggios, but please let's keep it super simple. For example, literally M, I, P, P, I, F, go up and down. Like I said, simple, repetitive, useful, in tempo, we'll try to keep it steady, no crazy sudden movements. Really. Now, I would just like to uh, share a couple of tips uh, when it comes to scales. And then we'll move to like actual playing, actual playing. Uh, we'll move to that area. So I don't know if you are doing scales. Uh, you can quote me on this. Scales are really the most useful exercise in existence uh, in any instrument. Uh, it's really not my fault, it's just how they work, and it's simply because of the nature of our instruments and the program that we are playing. There is no chance that you won't encounter a scale in your everyday practice and working um, uh, on your concert program. You will absolutely find it. What I like to do is uh, to take something quite simple, let's say a C major scale. I'm just do, gonna do an example um, of a two octave scale. So this is, I think, what most people are doing these days. So. This is very 
because we are connecting left and right hand. Also, we are working on what we worked on with the left hand, on the positions, right? And also by keeping things relatively simple in the right hand, we have plenty of room to really work out all of the problems, if we have problems. Now, what I used to do, and teachers uh, didn't really appreciate this, they called me a bit naughty. Actually, naughty is one of the first English words I learned when I was a kid. Uh, back then I spelled it N-O-T-T-Y, but you know, I learned over time. Uh, but this was my naughty thing with two octave scales. I think you're gonna love this. So what I didn't appreciate about this two octave pattern is this. When you reach the leading note, this is the leading note, B, in C major, you change positions. I uh, cringe. Uh, when I have to do this, I would never play it like this um, in like in an actual piece. So that's why I change the pattern. So I usually do this when I'm practicing. And I've done this uh, ever since I was a kid. So I don't know if you can see what I did there. So I kind of cheated a little bit with the extended position and then I switched very gradually. So there are no standard movements. You know, it, it's like nothing because I actually uh, uh, decreased the amount of work I had to do. That was one of my main goals, especially in high school. Do as little as work as possible and get the best grades as possible. I'll give you a couple of tips on that as well. Uh, for playing, this is great. Alternate between these two. Why? Because this, even though it's not the most gorgeous transition, it's still kind of a nice way to practice transitions, practice changing positions, you know? Uh, what's great about these patterns is that they do not use open strings. Remember, whenever you have open strings, you cannot use that as a pattern. When you have, when you don't have any open strings, for example, in these two uh, patterns, you can actually transfer them to literally any place on the fretboard, providing, of course, that you have enough room for the left hand to actually do it. So you can play equally, you know, B major or like F sharp major, because it's the same pattern. Uh, I would just like to share. Um, that actual pattern with you. I'm gonna share my screen, just very, um, I hope you can see it. So hi, this is my Mac. Uh, so this, this is what I uh, was talking about. Uh, I know that this might look a bit crazy in the beginning, but if we just, you know, take a moment and focus on what's written, this is actually what you see when you look at your left hand, when you're playing, in this case, two octave major scales. This is literally what you see. So on the left side, we have strings, one through six, going from top to bottom. And then the right side, we have Roman numerals, which indicate frets. And numbers indicate, of course, Fingerings. You don't have to write this down, it's okay. You will get this after uh, the lecture, so you don't have to worry about memorizing anything. I don't know if you want to do a screenshot of this, that's also fine, but really, I will send, send this, you don't have to worry. Um, and this is uh, enormously useful. Uh, uh, scales tick every single box uh, regarding uh, technical exercises, super simple repetitive, extremely useful. And I promise if you just do this again, couple of minutes, five to 10 minutes a day, not five hours, uh, I think it will seem massive improvements. I would just like to switch your attention to this first thing that's on this page, which is a diatonic position. So this is not technically a scale, but you're just playing all of the notes, that's why it's called diatonic, 
all the nodes that are available that can be found in this particular scale. So in this case, if you're gonna uh, look at it as a major, this is a D major. Uh, so I'm just gonna play it, I don't think you can see me from the top. to Sejan view again, uh, I. Uh, so this is what I just played. Again, brilliant thing with this is because, again, there are no open strings. You can literally play this anywhere. So. Or, Okay, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but the point is that uh, by doing these exercises, again, they're super simple. You can actually go through your entire fretboard and really see what's going on, you know, what's happening, what you have to do, how do your fingers move. Uh, a very useful thing with this is that, like I said before, you are absolutely going to find this in every single thing you play, <laughs> whether you want to or not, but this is fine. This is why we practice, you know. But and now, in the end of this uh, part one, I just want to um, make like a brief summary of what we've done. So number one, simple, repetitive, useful, alternate between left and right hand exercises to keep things like more interesting and also more importantly, prevent injuries or any discomfort. And then number three, connect left and right hand by doing scales. I will share uh, my screen one more time with you so you can just see two other examples of scales I prepared uh, for you. I hope you can see it, okay. Uh, so this first page is what we just played. This second page, you really don't have to worry too much about this. This looks super fancy, it's really not. So these are just versions of two octave scales. You just kind of take a couple of minutes each day to just kind of go through them. Just think about what these patterns represent um, and then try to kind of slowly incorporate them in your everyday practice routine. You're gonna see results immediately, trust me. This is not like a, a fat diet. You know, this like actually works. And I wanted to share with you this as well. <clears throat> These are three octave scales. Like I said, I'm going to use beginner, intermediate, and advanced level material. This is definitely advanced level because, first of all, we have a completely new octave. We have a third octave added. And also, these are a bit more tricky because you have at least two position changes. You have to be kind of patient when you're working on these. Um, but again, if you're going to trust my judgment, invest some time in um, going through this. You know, at least like bit by bit, you know. You don't have to do the entire thing all, uh, at once. Just kind of see, explore what's happening. I'm gonna play them. I hope you can see me again. I hope. Uh, so this is uh, the example. This is a G major scale in three octaves. <laughs> Again, depending on your level, important thing is just take your time. Don't worry about things too much. Like I said, life is complicated enough. The most important thing is not to panic and take it easy. But two very important things. Please stop immediately. And by this, I mean immediately when you feel any pain and discomfort. We don't, we're not playing cricket. We are not boxers. We are not playing American football. 
no pain, no gain doesn't, uh, it's not applicable in our situation, you know. Take your time and listen to what your body is saying. If you feel pain, stop immediately because that is usually an extremely bad sign. These things are very delicate, you know. Uh, and what we are doing with our fingers, and especially nails, but nails are a completely different subject. We'll do an entire lecture on them. Um, you really have to listen to what's happening in your system, you know, because some of these things can lead to like irreversible damage. Please don't. This is something I learned from singers because vocal cords are actually equally sensitive and extremely delicate. If you overwork them, if you do something uh, that's uh, not particularly smart, you know, you can really do damage. So if you're going to trust an experienced guitar player, please, no seven, eight, nine hour practice sessions. Keep it simple, short, take your time, and stop whenever you feel any sort of pain. One encouraging thing for uh, the end of this first part is that I know that this might seem a bit daunting at first, but think of it in like layers. Okay. Wow, uh, someone is being a bit naughty upstairs. Uh, think of it as layers. You know, I like to use food uh, references and uh, analogies, so like an onion, for example, or if you're more into geometry, let's say like concentric circles, you know circles that have the same center, but have different uh, radii, which is a plural of radius. Uh, these are layers, you know. Uh, go from inner circles, circles to outer circles, but gradually. Don't jump between levels, don't force yourself, and also don't try to do too much at once. Uh, it will probably backfire. So like I said again, really take your time. Think about what you're doing go between these levels don't always push with these advanced level exercises because they are really not the best it's just an example of an exercise and 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 again most importantly just listen to what your body is telling you please now i'm just going to take a sip of water that's been a, mm, a lot of talking um so now we will uh, go to our main course uh, for today, and that is the example that I sent you. I hope that you all received it and that you listened uh, to this piece. So it's uh, Rosita. I will share my screen one more time with you. And also, please, if you have any questions, I acknowledge them, I appreciate them, but please save them for the end of the lecture because there's a, still a bit more to go through. Okay, uh, this is what I sent you, uh, Rosita. I hope that you received it. Uh, if you haven't, that's still okay because I'm gonna send, uh, send all of this uh, later. We'll exchange contact info, it's okay, uh, nothing to worry about. I'm gonna switch one more time. Okay, so here's the thing. So when people go to my concerts and listen to things, they think that it just happens, you know? Uh, and yes, it's beautiful music. everything is very charming and elegant. Now, uh, they don't know this, but since we are playing, we know how much work it actually goes into performing at least. So I will actually show you, literally show you what I do when I practice a brand new piece. This is really something that I do every single time. It works. 100% if I may use such uh, bold estimations. And again, just a small disclaimer, don't worry if you are not familiar with all of these elements, with some of the terminology, don't worry. That's why I use that onion analogy or circles analogy. If you are not a big fan of onions, 
you can create as many layers as you wish. It's completely up to you. What I would like to do here, and this is just gonna be 20 minutes or so, nothing too long, just to show you how to approach a brand new piece. So let's say you've never heard Rosita before and you're playing it for the first time. Okay, I will share my screen for let's say 10 or so minutes just to explain what I do when I look at a brand new piece of music. Okay, so I hope you can see it. Okay, so we have this and then we have this. I hope you can see it. If you can, then I can maybe just give me a sign that we see these two pages. Great, excellent, okay. So, uh, I know that these kind of YouTube test videos are apparently very popular right now. I know that I watch some of them, so I think maybe you will find this interesting. This is what a question uh, on my music analysis test would look like. So we used to go through things like this every week. Um, in elementary school, but especially in high school, it was every single week we had uh, a test like this. Okay, so we will get a piece of music, usually just one, actual one paper. Uh, so sometimes it wasn't even a complete piece, but usually it was, it was just one piece. In this case, we are very lucky because we have Rosita, which is exactly uh, one piece of paper. Now, the problem with this exam is that you wouldn't have these information. You wouldn't know the composer. This would be blank. You wouldn't know the instrument for which it was composed. This would also be blank. And most importantly, the title would be blank. Uh, so this will <laughs> immediately increase your anxiety level when you're doing tests. I think we can all relate to that. I think a lot of you. Uh, are going through stuff like this. So believe me, I know how you feel. Now, we are lucky because we have this information and now we just have to read them. Okay, so the composer is Francisco Tarega, who I really don't think needs uh, too much special introduction. He is absolutely one of the greatest classical guitarists of all time and a truly brilliant composer, one of my favorites. And I always enjoy playing, uh, playing his music. I still to this day play Rosita. I actually played it in my last concert in March, which was interestingly enough, one of the last concerts in Croatia altogether. So I was very lucky to play it. Um, now in the test, you were supposed to write the composer's uh, year or date of birth and death, which for Tarega is 1852 and 1909 respectively. Why is this important? Just to kind of be able to put him in sort of historical perspective. So he definitely belongs smack in the middle of this romantic period. Now, technically he belongs to a slightly later romantic period, but because Tarega was quite a conservative composer, he definitely belongs in this, let's say, true romantic group. Now, uh, you would, in this test, th again, this is just one question, you would have here a separate piece of paper in which uh, you're supposed to write any additional notes or some comments on what you wrote uh, in your first piece of paper. Mind you, you had 10 minutes to do all of this, so uh, you didn't have too much time to explore what you were doing. You were just expected to do some basic biographical information. I would definitely advise you to do this with every piece of music that you play. Sometimes in my master classes, I find out that students have no idea who they're playing. I think that's kind of unacceptable. So please, when you do this, start with this, please. Now, the other blank thing was this, para guitarra. Um, so of course, since we are playing guitar, we know what we're playing. Uh, in some other cases, it wasn't really as straightforward, but the reason why I'm saying this is that we had to make some comments based on the instrument for which this piece was composed. In our case, you could write for guitar that it sounds an octave lower than it's written. You know, I hope that we are all aware of this. So all of this sounds, you know, 
for example, this beginning A. The way it's written, it's actually this. But it sounds like this. This is just one small note, you know. You will write this, and then you will go to the title of the piece. Okay, great. So, it's a Rosita. So we can say that it's dedicated to Senorita Rosita Gonzalez de Melo, lucky her. Uh, Tanagal was a very smart person to give his piece as a female title, which is always a good idea. There's, it's a win-win situation, so a smart person. But what's also important is that he has a subtitle here, so it's a polka. Now, uh, living in this uh, region of the world, I'm quite familiar with this. I actually love polka music. I think it's fantastic. Uh, so you would be expected to just write a couple of uh, information on the actual piece of music. So it's a dance which originated in the Bohemian um, region, uh, specifically today's Czech Republic. So Bohemia doesn't exist anymore as a country. Uh, and it belongs to the second quarter of the 19th century. And uh, since Czech Republic and Croatia have two very similar languages because we belong to the same group of uh, Slavic languages, this title will be immediately very funny to me because this literally means half dance in female forms, the female gender uh, now. But Paul, or polka literally means half. Now, uh, there is not a clear consensus on the etymology of this word, but the, uh, it's important to know that in polka you actually have half steps, like actual dance moves, which I'm not going to show for you now because I'm not crazy. Uh, but I embarrass myself enough. So, anyway, there are half steps, and also it refers to the time signature. You know, I hope you can see that this little sprinkle of a mouse uh, here showing two fours. Two fours is also colloquially known as half signature. Uh, you know, so another fun fact. Then you'd be expected to identify the tempo of the piece. Now, this would usually be filled with something else. He decided to just write polka, assuming that people understood the tempo that it's performed in. Uh, the polka is actually a moderately fast dance. It's nothing crazy. Uh, so it's just slightly below allegro tempo, which is, let's say, a true fast tempo. So it's an allegretto. You could put allegro moderato as well, but this is more of an allegretto. I just put in the small question mark here because it, it wasn't simply it wasn't explicitly stated that it's an allegretto, so you are assuming based on your previous knowledge, okay, this is, you know. Then you will look at the larger structure of the piece, which is something that I always encourage my students to do when they uh, start working on something brand new. What's the form of this piece, you know? What was he thinking? Now, if you know something about polka, about some other dances like a polonaise or a waltz, an example of which we had earlier this week, then you would also already know which kind of form to anticipate. And you would usually write it here in the upper right corner, um, preferably on that other <laughs> uh, piece of paper, but I didn't want to, you know, create more confusions. This is a classic ternary form. What that means is that you have an A section, which is this. It goes until fin, meaning the end. Then you have a B section, which is here, until the end of the page. But since it's not the end of the piece, it says here da capo, hasta fin. So you need to play, okay, I'm just gonna move this. Uh, you just have to play from the beginning until the end. So, uh, important note here, and you would also write this down, is when you have a da capo, or when you have a ds, meaning da segno, from the sign, it means that you go from the beginning and you skip repetition. So immediately go to the second part. And that's why the correct form and formula for this piece would be a, b, and a followed by an apostrophe. 
An apostrophe just indicates that there is just some small variation in that A in comparison to this first A. And then above, <coughs> I'm sorry, and then above these uh, letters, you will write the basic harmony or basic key of that um, section. So in section A, the main key is D major. Then in the B section, we go to the subdominant major, which is G major. And then, of course, because we repeat A, we go back to D major. Then, uh, and I know this was a, a really long test, you know, bear with me. Uh, like, and like I said, you only have like five to 10 minutes to do all of this. So it's really good training. You would have to write down the phrases. Uh, so uh, you would have to go into this like slightly microstructure just to see like what's happening, how the piece is constructed. And then you will identify all of this, uh, these um, phrases, which are basically equivalent of sentences in language. That's why we all, all, always have so many connections between music and language. It's because their uh, underlying mechanisms are so similar. And I think it's really important when you're playing something to be aware of that. Uh, when you are working on a language, when you're working on new languages, learning foreign languages, always a good idea to take some time to understand the structure of the syntax of the sentences. It doesn't take too much work, but it's uh, especially important to start early. So that's why I also encourage my students to do this. Kind of see like what's happening. And then in this upper right corner, finish the form. Then you would also identify the main motifs. So motifs are uh, basically short ideas and basic uh, formal building blocks of music. You can think of them as Legos, which you connect and you get this, you know, elaborate massive Lego structure. And it's a fun way of looking at it. I identified six different motifs which Tarega actually uses to construct his entire piece. And he, he has done this really masterfully, I think especially in Rosita. Uh, and then after all of that, if that wasn't enough, you would also write down harmonic structure, but in detail, so not like whatever. So we had that lecture on Monday, really great lecture on how to think harmonically. I will not go through all of these things uh, uh, right now because we don't have enough time. Uh, but I would definitely encourage you to go through this by yourselves at home. I'm just going to give you a short idea of what, of what these numbers, Roman numerals, mean. So this is a tonic, first degree, and followed by a six four. This is the second. Okay, so this is just a disclaimer this is i'm thinking for intermediate or advanced level musicians this is the second inversion of that first degree followed by a dominant chord now this is an inversion of the dominant seven why is this important it's because it's quite characteristic of a polka polka simply uh, because it's such a lively charming dance it simply alternates between tonic and and dominant um, harmonies. Uh, so if you know something about these pieces beforehand, you already know what to expect. That's why I think it's really important to try to connect as much information as possible. Um, uh, 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 so you can actually see here how much he alternates between tonic and dominant harmonies. Whenever you see uh, the alteration, so a note that doesn't belong in that key, that's usually an indicative of a secondary dominant. And in this case, it's a dominant for the dominant. I uh, actually hear it as a subdominant harmony, so don't pay attention to this. Just think of it as another way to get from point A to B, you know, from tonic to dominant harmony. And you can see here that he actually mirrors that harmony. Uh, this uh, B section is particularly brilliant 
because he actually puts the main melody in the middle line, which I think it's gorgeous. I'm gonna play it for you so you can actually. So we end on a. I'm gonna exaggerate so just you can uh, hear the middle section. So. I'm not going to play like this, I just want, wanted to uh, spotlight one particular thing uh, in this piece. Uh, uh, and then uh, the important thing is that in this B section, he moves to the subdominant harmony, which I think is a brilliant move because it completely changes the color of the piece without uh, making it so different that you struggle to find connections between A and B. Uh, and also, I would make a note of that in my accompanying piece of paper. Uh, so without further ado, so this is what one of those questions would look like. I'm not sure which grade I would get for this, what would the score be. I think it would be okay. I think it's missing a couple of details, but I think I would do okay. Um, if I'm going to be too strict, yeah, I'll probably find some things here and there, but this is mostly it. Now, I just want to share another thing, and I will then switch off uh, screen sharing, just so you can see how I actually see this. This is how I see um, in my mind. This is how I see music when I look at it. Uh, now, don't worry, I will share all of this with you. You don't have to worry. Uh, I, I like to connect things with colors. I think it's um, very useful and very memorable because it's simply how human memory works. We're very good at remembering images, especially quite striking, memorable images. Uh, so I actually like to do this when I'm working on something new. I, I have a separate, clean uh, piece of sheet music and I just use my, you know, Crayons are like color markers to uh, color pencils just to kind of sketch out what I see in my mind. And then, okay, so I made a small chart here in the upper part. So you can actually see the alternation between tonic and dominant harmony, how there are so many, you know. I think colors really help in this case because things become a bit more apparent. Now, in this, just uh, one small note here on the upper left corner. I also left a list of motifs. So this first one is a gula, that's a short for a glissando. That's the first motif. Then I put the polka motif, pol, which is. That's a quite a characteristic polka motif. Then I put a running motif. Or this kind of fading yellow motif is a D, meaning a third, because a third harmony is quite prominent in this piece. You know, it, it's an actual separate motif. Now an S, meaning the singing motif, it's this one of the main building blocks of this piece. And then also the arpeggio motif, which is this. And uh, you know, stuff like this. Okay, so I won't bother with this anymore. I will go back to Sejan mode. I think you can hear me and see me, hopefully. I hope. And I hope that you have this music in front of you. If not, that's okay. I just wanted to uh, share what my thought process is be before I actually even begin to work on a new piece. And uh, I think that you will agree uh, with me when uh, I say that you cannot actually look at the piece the same way after you analyze it like this. Like it actually changes 
you know, the way you look at the things actually changes when you put these layers into it. Uh, now, some people don't think that this is as important. I kind of don't agree because uh, it just uh, allows me to enjoy this even more, you know, because I'm familiar with more things. It doesn't take a away anything from the enjoyment of music. If anything, it actually adds something to it. So I just want to briefly uh, uh, share some of the things that we need to work on now that, especially that we know um, the formal and harmonic structure of the piece. Uh, so we'll start with the glissando, which is a very common guitar technique. So just the beginning. So. But let's actually start from the very beginning. So it's an octave, it's an upbeat. So uh, let's say a bar zero. It's a quarter note. Be mindful of that as well, not a half note or anything like that, eighth note. But it's now, when you notice when I do this, I don't do this. There are no jerky movements, and I also don't use positions all the time. Now, when I'm doing this, I'm actually already preparing for this. So I'm going from a position to a contracted position. So. You see it? A uh, small disclaimer again before we continue. I really appreciate practicing in slightly slower tempo. It's very useful because it gives you plenty of time and space to work out your problems and also work in small sections. That's why I think it's even more important to go through these motifs at first and these phrases, so you can actually see what uh, the ways you can um, divide the piece, you can work on it more efficiently. Okay, now we have the... This comes from the, that typical polka motif. You know, I, I grew up with this. <laughs> I mean, I could really, I could listen to this all day. I love it. It's... Um, it's so uplifting, it always makes my day. I love polka music, huge fan. Um, but now, <clears throat> after this uh, delightful motif, we have first done in the harmony of the day, and now we go to this. Now, I think this looks quite familiar. From the... I told you that we cannot escape it. We cannot escape scales. They are everywhere. It's like the walking dead. They are all around us. Let's just accept it. It's fine. Let's work on it. So here we have that classic position with a short half scale. And now we reach probably one of the first tricky parts of the piece. Uh, we can hear in some performances, it's a bit... I'm not a huge fan of repeating same fingerings all the time. That's why, if you look at the scores, I actually play a different fingering. So I play a... Instead of... Right? So Tereka says... But I play... Say this is my artistic freedom. You know, I apologize to Tanika, but I find this fingering a bit more convenient. Point number two: If you find fingerings that are more suitable for you, do it. Don't do something that someone else is doing just because they're doing it. Like I told you before, before the technical exercises, it needs, things need to be useful for you. Something that works for you will not work for someone else. And this is. Just a really small, simple example of that. Um, also, I think you notice something else immediately. I think this looks quite familiar from the... I told you, I told you they're all going to come back. Every single technical exercise is going to come back to want you. Uh, this is why we work on this, because if you do, from part A uh, of the lecture, if you do these exercises, and I mean every day, please, 
less than 15 minutes, 30 at most. They will build up, they will add up, they won't evaporate and disappear, and they will help you tremendously in everything that you're doing. Uh, so, if you have problems with this, I would actually isolate just that tiny segment just to see what's happening. So, so just that. Don't play. Just to get to this part. No. Have some, let's say, a somewhat unpopular self discipline and start from different sections. Point number three. And maybe you should write this down because this is quite important. This was one of the main things that I used in my practice sessions and it works perfectly. And this is that I forced myself, at first, later it just became second nature, to start from a different place. So every time I would play Rosita, I would start from a different section. I never started from the beginning twice. It's a bit harder than it sounds because it does require some thinking and self-discipline. I'm not a huge fan of self-discipline, but in practicing it really works because it forces you to really think about what um, you're playing and connecting it with that music analysis example, the test example, it just shows you how important it is to go through things before you start playing it on your guitar because you're already familiar with some things without even touching the instrument. So we have all these lovely thirds. Another glissando motif, but not written as a glissando motif. Beautiful tonic. And then he takes us somewhere else. Another secondary dominant. Arpeggio motif. This is for advanced students. I know this piece is technically grade five or six, but it's actually much harder than it looks. This is an example of a half barre. So I think we are all familiar with the barre technique, you know, a left hand technique in which you are playing um, several notes at the same time with the same finger. You know, now this is a half barre, right? Uh, sorry. So you're not using this, you're just using this. So you're gonna have to bend or break your finger in a way so it just reaches that part of the fretboard that you need. You have to do this. Um, this requires practice. I don't have any natural predisposition for this. this. This is just years of practice. I would also suggest that you don't skip this practice as well. Uh, and it's not terribly popular, but you know, you can do it. It's nothing, um, nothing scary, you know. And then we end with a and if we go to the small B section, we actually continue with that um, dominant harmony. I'm gonna play it. I think you, you already know what I'm gonna say with this. It's literally the pattern that we played in the first part. I told you they are everywhere around us, scales are everywhere. We have an actual example with the same finger. <laughs> you know, Tarika writes played in the sixth position. If you watch my video, uh, you can see that I play it in the repetition. So he says this. First time I played in the first position, and the second. Why? Because I wanted to keep the melody on the first string. So. the entire reason why you know there's no uh, special underlying philosophy why I decided to do it you know uh, <clears throat> a great example of a sequence here so he uses the motif to gradually go up
when you go through it, let's say technically, uh, theoretically, you will remember it forever. You know, there is no chance that you will ever forget this. You know, and also have this uh, beautiful example of subdominant harmony. Now, in these two parts, I didn't play like this. I use a trick which is called portamento. Portamento is a technique which is similar to a glissando, but it literally means in Italian carrying a note from one place to the next. Portamento. So I'm using fourth finger here. You can actually make a separate technical exercise just from this. Just So keep your fingers relatively flexible, elbows flexible, nothing too rigid, no rigid movements, no sudden movements, please don't. Um, and just work on it a little bit, see how it goes. I, I promise you, in no time you will feel, if you are not already, you will feel completely comfortable with these sorts of passages. It will be nothing, like second major, you know, and same thing goes with this. <laughs> Also here, I don't play. You know, it's play it slightly slower. You can see what I did there. You know, another arpeggio motif with the half bare. And that's it, we literally done the first part. Now the second part, like I said, starts with my favorite. It's the um, melody in the <clears throat> middle part. I think some of you asked a question on Monday, what happens with the middle section? Well, this is a great example because you have a bass underlying and given that harmonic structure, and you have these two outer lines, let's say alto and soprano line, and you have this beautiful melody in the tenor line. So now I exaggerated the other lines, I played them extra staccato, but just so that I can emphasize this melody more. When you play glissando and glissandi, plural, just be especially mindful of where your fingers are moving. You know, just to, let's like do this. Yeah, it's funny. Great. But let's be a bit more precise. And so actually look. Or really look at where your fingers are going. It helps tremendously if you're aware of the um, chord structure, because then you know exactly where you need to be. This is another beautiful example of a sequence. So a sequence is just um, a compositional technique, which literally means a restatement of a previously uh, lined out thematic material. It just goes up a bit or down a bit. And in this, this case, diatonically. So we don't have any crazy movements. Everything is very chillaxed and uh, super charming and beautiful. It's amazing. And he wrote this paragraph brilliantly. I think that this piece has so many interesting layers. It's crazy. Uh, and then he has a restatement of the theme. And then we have, again, this kind of broken barre thing. And if you listen to the recording that I made on YouTube, I actually make a mistake here. Uh, I, I didn't. <laughs> this happened in the recording. Why? Because I was maybe slightly too anxious to uh, go from uh, 
tonic harmony to that secondary dominant for the beautiful second degree. So we have an actual A minor chord in this beautiful routine. It's really genius, you know. I guess I was a bit too anxious, so that's why it's always important to really take your time, think about what you're doing. Also, another point is I guess mistakes happen if you acknowledge them, if you accept the fact that you can work on them, then it's a win-win situation. And then after this, we go to a, one of very few subdominant harmonies, which we pair. And we have a restatement. We have that A apostrophe. You can basically practice the entire piece in one day in like an hour. And I know I might be maybe oversimplify things a little bit, but trust me, this is like actually how it works, you know. This is how I practice everything, regardless of the level of the piece. Like I said, even though it's, I think Veda knows this, this is a very SM 5 or 6. I literally played it two months ago in a concert, and I'm a 33-year-old concert guitarist. So <laughs> some things really uh, I, I, like eternal, you know, and I think Tariqa's repertoire definitely falls in that category of really exceptionally beautiful, extremely valuable music. And I think we should all as guitarists be very lucky that we have him on our team, you know, because so many other composers weren't on our team, now weren't they? Uh, speaking of those composers, uh, if you're gonna get into this type of music, I would really recommend that you start listening to pieces written by composers whose last name starts with a sh. So, uh, Schumann, definitely, uh, Schubert, uh, Strauss, by Strauss I mean Johann Jr. and Sr., not Ricard. Ricard belongs to a, a slightly different group of composers, but you know, if you like that music, great. Sh uh, I think Chopin also technically <laughs> belongs in that group, but I would steer away from people like Schoenberg and maybe Shostakovich for now. Uh, so switch to this first group of sh composers. Why? Because Tarenga was heavily influenced by their work, specifically Schumann, Schubert, Strauss, Chopin. <laughs> and even made transcriptions of their words, and he was a very skillful uh, piano player. So you know, in order to understand how composer thinks, it's really good to look at the rest of his opus and to also become familiar with uh, the works of his contemporaries and the works of composers that he personally admired. You know, it's, um, you know, just one of my uh, parting advice. Um, now, before I go, uh, no, no, I'm not gonna go. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna just stop the recording in a moment and we're gonna have a Q&A. I'm sure that you have uh, plenty of questions. Don't worry, I'm not going anywhere. I'm gonna answer that. Uh, yeah, we have plenty of time as we are approaching the end of the, this formal part of the lecture. Um, I just want to share a couple of um, anecdotes from my my personal experiences, like I said before, uh, from my high school years. I think they're particularly interesting because I learned uh, more, uh, I, I think, than ever before that and even after. Even though I went to like amazing universities, I studied at the Royal Academy of Music in London, which is one of the leading music schools in the world, and it was brilliant. <laughs> um, and I, I learned most things I can actually pinpoint in my junior year in high school. Why? Um, 
why is this important? I think it's because a lot of people don't know. Some of the people who grew up with me didn't believe me, but that's mostly because they're guitarists and we were, I guess, always competing with each other. <clears throat> uh, but actually, I didn't have enough time to practice. I, I really didn't. Sometimes I would have like an actual hour to practice a thing, and that's it. I would practice maybe seven to 10 hours a week, simply because I, I didn't have it physically enough time to do all of the work that was required. Now, mind you, I wasn't, you know, just a whatever at that point. I won the national championship, I think, for the third time in a row that year, and also won a couple of international competitions. If we're going to measure success by competitions, but let's say in high school years, it was a thing. Uh, so I was already on a very high level. Uh, like really, like I'm not uh, over exaggerating. So I just want to share my screen one more time. I think you're gonna appreciate this. Uh, I'm gonna share with you my schedule. I'm gonna share with you my junior year schedule. Can you see it? Okay, Ben is gonna give me a sign. <laughs> okay, so I think this is like literally insane. I have a headache just watching this again. Uh, this is yeah, like 2003 or four. This was my junior year in high school. I was 16, 17. I don't know about you. I really don't see any space for six hours of guitar practice. You know, granted that you won't fail every single subject. <laughs> That's on this list. I mean, this is a massive challenge. Why am I telling you this? Um, I mean, of course, I'm, I'm proud of this uh, immensely because uh, this was a really a tremendous feat try just to fit everything in one day, in one week. This was an, a, a tremendous amount of work. And this actually made me work on uh, different study and practice techniques, how to be most efficient with what I do. So when I studied, when I practiced, not to do just whatever, but to actually be very strategic and deliberate with my studying and practicing. I know this might sound a bit clinical at first. I mean, look at my subjects. I mean, there I have a background of clinical things, you know, uh, uh, like math. I mean, it's just, it's my background. Uh, but it was incredibly useful to really explore how not how much, but how I study, how I practice. And uh, I hope that today you, you learned something from this guitar example. I would just like to point out a couple of things from this truly insane schedule. So this on a Wednesday, this is that music analysis class. I think you can see it, that we had that uh, sample test question from Rosita. It was my favorite subject in this school. Uh, now, just one more thing. These are two separate schools. So the one with, let's say, normal subjects, that was 8, 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. Then I had a break, and this is the music section. So these are two physically separate schools. And I can, uh, you can imagine, that, like, this is a lot of homework. But it's okay, I survived, I'm still here. Uh, more or less. Uh, so this was extremely useful to have good teachers in music analysis class because it, it, it helped me tremendously with my practicing, uh, even though my confidence level was actually quite low when I started this class. I wasn't feeling it. So I'm telling you, I promise, just to stick with it and uh, you will improve, I think, dramatically. Uh, also, I would uh, stress something else out, and this is everyone's favorite subject, and it's this. Uh, now, this is a fun fact about me. Uh, I think a lot of you will appreciate math. I think you can see it in my lecture style. I mentioned uh, multiplication tables and geometry several times. So, uh, in elementary school, in grades six, seven, eight, I was convinced by my teachers, who were not brilliant teachers, so, I mean, you know, we all have 
bad sides that math is not for me you know and i kind of internalized that and i accepted it i said you know what fine you're both probably right and then high school happened and i realized you know what uh, this is gonna be a humongous mess if you don't actually pick it up and work a bit harder a bit smarter and really invest in what you're doing you're actually gonna fail and this is what happened in my freshman year and unfortunately in some parts of my sophomore year i was at the bottom of my class now this school that i went to is one of the top schools in the country i think you can also see from the intensity of the academic curriculum here it was full of really ambitious overachievers uh myself included uh, but the thing is that was really falling behind and this year was a major breaking point for me because I decided to invest in private tutor. These are private lessons on Saturdays. If you can notice something from this, this is what you're doing. You are investing in private tutoring from 4 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. on a Saturday. So I, I, I love that connection between you and me right now. This is a great thing. You know, we have plenty of time to do other things to be on social media and to play, I don't know, Candy Crush or whatever. But if you have some time and place to invest, this is an investment uh, in our knowledge, in our education, that's brilliant. Now, what this subject specifically taught me is the importance of consistency. So practice every day, not every other day or whatever, every day to be deliberate with your practicing, to really think about what you're doing and also the importance of doing practice programs. That's why when I see a piece of music like Rosita, when I see a waltz, I've gone through these practice programs so many times, specifically here in music analysis, that I can already see the structure, I can see it. And this um, is especially useful because of the memory. Like I feel like it's engraved in my brain, like it's there forever. That, that's how confident I feel uh, when I look at a certain uh, piece of music, you know. And I think this is really useful advice. Um, and being the kid with, well, yes, with the lowest grade in math, especially my freshman year, which was embarrassing, I got a hundred in every single test in my junior year. If I may repeat that, a hundred in a really tough school, in every single test, which actually made me number one in class, in math. Yes, this sad, pathetic classical guitarist was number one in math. And like a really crazily competitive, overachieving high school. It just shows you I'm not a savant, I'm not naturally talented in math, I'm just interested in studying and learning. And this is an example where it really worked out in my favor, kind of. I will switch back to this. I, I, can, I can share this with you if you want this as well in your study material. Uh, kind of backfired because I, was, I found myself doing other people's homeworks uh, people who were better than me the year before. I mean, that was like, what, what happened? Uh, so it kind of backfired. Uh, but after that junior year, the dust kind of settled and, and it was fine. Uh, so the, my point is that because I made this conscious decision to be a bit more strategic, a bit more deliberate in what I'm doing, in what I'm practicing, it actually improved both my grades in this regular school, standard school, and uh, in my body. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm happy that I went through this. Like I said, uh, looking at that schedule gave me some flashbacks. I would definitely feel a headache here. Uh, I mean, it, it, because I just remember all the homework that I had to do, uh, but it's okay, you know. Also, you know, I, it, who's gonna toot my horn if I'm not gonna toot it myself? Uh, I was n number one, number one in my music school for the entire high school. Uh, and also in guitar level, on the national level, I was number one. I won every single national championship and I spent most of my time studying physics and math. Um, so 
I definitely did not see it as a waste of time. If anything, like I said before, throughout my lecture, it really helped me understand or better understand myself as a learner and as a performer. And today I really look at it as an invaluable, irreplaceable experience. And I really appreciate what I learned, especially in high school. Uh, so thank you for listening to that lecture. If maybe Beta can join uh, our conversation now, just to give me a bit, bit of a break from uh, speaking. Slightly damaging my vocal cords. Really, thank you so much. Baby. This is, uh, I mean, I wish I had somebody tell me these things when I was younger. Maybe me I too. <laughs> No, uh, really, me too, because no one talked about practicing. It, uh, fun fact, fun fact. Uh, I will share this screen one more time, and I will I'll ask you to see one discrepancy here. Okay. If you can look at this. I don't know if you noticed. There is no guitar. I have 60 classes a week, and there's no guitar. I'm not making this stuff up. I have philosophy, I have logic, this is formal logic, which I really recommend people to do if they're gonna go into programming, it's very useful. I had chemistry, I learned all about amino acids, uh, and it was brilliant. I had hard format, Latin, I had everything, okay, I'm not gonna change this. There's no guitar. Uh, my teacher went on maternity leave because she had her second baby, and other uh, some of her other students dropped out and I was left alone, featureless, in my junior year. <laughs> uh, so I had sporadic guitar lessons, doing seminars like this, only in person, and doing private tutoring. Um, the important thing is that I invested in that, well, specifically my parents, <laughs> and I really thank them for this support that was Tremendous, and my sisters as well. Who, she's a good kid. She's an actual doctor. Uh, but yeah, I'm just, uh, I learned so much from them, and they always supported my work. And uh, in investing in these private lessons was exceptionally important, especially because I was left kind of stranded by my music school. They just didn't care. But the important thing is that you care <laughs> about what you do, and you care about. Uh, the way you manage your time, you know, because this is your life. <laughs> uh, oh, thank you. I can join. Yeah. Yes. I, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you have questions. Now is the time to start typing. Um, yeah, uh, I think I've already said thanks. Thanks to you. Uh, um, Oh, yes, you're welcome. I, I mean, if Bena has any questions, maybe you can kick things off with with a video question. I'll tell you what, uh, maybe, I, I mean, for me, the, I had a lot of information coming in and I felt that uh, the fact that we've recorded it is going to be a good resource for me later. Yes. Uh, but I know <laughs> maybe uh, there would be some way for people to contact you after this because... Um, especially for those who want to have uh, advice or you want uh, an individual session mm -hmm. or something like this. Uh, Absolutely. So uh, I, I can share my email address with you. I'm perfectly fine, fine with that. Please. Um, oh, wait, uh, I can send this to everyone. Do I have that option? Yes, you, you can do that. Um, or I can send it to everybody later. Yeah, yeah. So it's my email address. Uh, and please feel free to contact me. You know, I'm not. Uh, coronavirus is not a computer virus. I, I'm very well aware of that fact, unlike some other people. Uh, so I will def definitely answer your messages. Yes. Bit of coronavirus humor for you. Uh huh. So I have uh, two things before I start asking the questions. One is that everybody here on the chat, um, if you, uh, 
if you have signed into Zoom with some different name that you registered, please message me your email address. Yeah. Because I've just done a quick attendance against the registration chart. And those of you who are here on some different name, maybe you sign in with your parents name or your friends name, just send me your email address so that we can share with you the Rosita sheets, the worksheets that Srijan has done and the technical exercise fretboard. We, he will uh, send that as well. Um, Srijan, should I start asking questions? Yes, please. Okay, there's one from Shantanu. He says, should we incorporate fretboard memorization into practice? How important mm -hmm. is it to memorize the fretboard and are there good techniques for that that you could share? Think of it as a great question. Think of it as a multiplication table. Uh, it's, it was hard at the beginning, uh, but after a couple of weeks, it was nothing, like seven times eight, four times six. I know there are a lot of adults who don't know this, uh, but that's, that's their problem. Uh, I'm just saying that it really is as simple as that. Okay. Super simple, and for that, just one one thing, I would use that diatonic thing. Why? Because you're playing all the notes in that scale. And then just go through it. Uh, that, that's uh, a couple of weeks of work. Not like literally a couple of weeks, this is like 10 minutes a day. Yeah. Okay, then the, the, there's another one um, from Anish. I want to ask if the left hand should ke be kept steady, in particular with the spider chromatic exercise. My left hand does a kind of yes. dance. Yes. I, I also do dancing moves when I play, but that's a deliberate choice. Um, you know, uh, that's why we are working on techniques. So we can develop that set of tools and then we can use at our leisure. When you don't have it, then you don't have that option. So I would really encourage you to keep things steady and then you can do a Serjan later. But for, you know, I'm aware of my movie. I would, yeah, yeah, <laughs> but if you actually look at it closely, it, it's quite stable. Um, you know, and that I can specifically pinpoint this to these left hand exercises. A lot of people actually ask me how do I do my left hand like that, but like this, <laughs> like this lecture, like that. That's my secret, basically. <clears throat> Losing my voice a little bit. Okay. Okay. How, how long should we practice the left hand and right hand exercises and the scales? Half an hour. Half an hour at most every, but I'm sorry, every day, every day. I would add another word between every and day, but I'm not gonna swear, but every day. <laughs> Please, every day, uh, because you cannot make this stuff up. This is all math training for me. Um, you cannot really skip practice events. Throughout my high school, and especially that year that I mentioned in my screen share, I really haven't missed a single practice session. Mm. It was very hard. I had to wake up sometimes very early <laughs> in the morning. And then after 15 lessons, do scales. But I really think it was worth it. It gave me that security. You know, when I play on stage, um, there is, first of all, no such thing as overconfidence if you're a stage performer. That term doesn't exist. <laughs> Uh, and doing all of these exercises, plus that theoretical aspect of words, I just know that everything's going to be okay when I perform. I can feel it because it's like cemented <laughs> in my brain. Also, I learned this from sports. As you can tell, I'm not big on sports myself, like doing it myself, but I, I'm a fan and I explored, you know, different training techniques. I actually learned a lot from them, specifically gymnastics and athletics. They have this uh, practice routine that I actually find really interesting. But maybe that's a, a different lecture. The thing is that you should develop your own routine and be comfortable. Yeah. Regarding yeah. this, there's a question, how do we balance mm -hmm. learning techniques that take a while? And exercises mm -hmm. related to that, say a barre and regular daily practice. 
Is it the so, same every day or should we make things different? Absolutely not. That's why I encourage you to do these concentric circles and onion -y things. Add new things, explore them, add new things, explore, add new things, explore, etc. Um, also, it really helps if you think of your um, practicing in weekly terms. For example, if I looked at my life daily, I would have collapsed 5 billion times when I was 16. I looked at it weekly and it actually really helped me put things in the perspective. If something was not working out on a Monday, which is fine because it's a Monday, uh, it gave me some confidence and encouragement that it was probably going to be okay on Friday. And it usually was. You just need to invest that time. I keep it simple, simple. So uh, there, how would you break down a four or five hour practice session? Uh, so if I have that much time in a day, how can I break it up? I can make it in two, two parts or three parts or? Yes. Um, I don't think even today I have four or five hours to practice. Uh, but no, I think I do, yeah. Uh, well today, um, yeah, I definitely have more time. Uh, I would divide it into three sections and they're all quite practical and I'll explain why. Morning, afternoon, and evening. So the same thing I did in high school, it would just be more elaborated and it would last longer. <laughs> uh, I literally had an hour or hour and a half uh, when I was 16. You know, half an hour in the morning, half an hour at like 2.30 p.m., you know, and then half an hour be before I collapse of exhaustion. <laughs> Uh, three parts, morning, afternoon, evening. Why? Mornings are great, especially if you're going to do competitions. That's why when I was 23 and 24 and my first rounds started at 8 a.m., that was nothing to me. It was like walk in the park because I've already gone through war regarding schedules. Playing at 8 a.m. was nothing. It was because I woke up early <laughs> and, and I would do this exercises, you know. Afternoon is usually when I get sleepy, even to this day. I don't know if you have similar problems. You just get, you know, un po' stanco in Italiano. Um, and those practice sessions kind of kept me alive, you know, focused. Um, it, it, they gave me this encouragement to, you know, keep going, even though it wasn't super fun. But evening practice sessions are especially important because that's when we do most of our work. We perform. I do my work in the nighttime. When everyone else is watching reality TV and scrolling through Netflix for two hours, I'm playing a concert at 8 or 8.30 p.m. This is when you have to be at the top of your game. And dividing your day like that really helps to put things in perspective. I would not definitely recommend to cram everything into one practice session. Practice or studying. I don't know how many of you are studying things, like other subjects, you know, not necessarily logic and philosophy, but other things. It always try to keep things uh, short, short-ish, you know. I was actually doing that Pomodoro technique before I knew it was a thing. Yeah. I would like practice for 25 and 30 minutes and then I would take a break. It was just like natural. My sister is not like that. She, maybe that's why she's a doctor and not. Uh, she really could study for hours uh, without any breaks, but it's because we are different people. Uh, but I learned so much from her. You know, again, like I said in the beginning, something that works for you might not for something someone else. Just listen to you know what your system is telling you. So Srijan, how much time do you have? Because there are questions. I don't want to keep you and maybe you can take things. Uh, since I'm on uh, quarantine time yeah. uh, and I'm practically on house arrest, I really have no place else to go. So it's fine. I can <laughs> stick around. Uh, I don't I'd let people know this. I, I shared this with Ben. She told me that she knew this. It's a creation invention quarantine. In 1377, during the Black Plague in Central Europe, in Southern Europe, 
technically, yeah, in Dubrovnik, we invented quarantine. So, quaranta, as in 40 days, in Italian, it's what it took for people to, you know, go over their black death routine and then join the rest of the population. Just a fun fact. <laughs> So now we've got um, one question about uh, how mm -hmm. to master a piece and be fluent with sight reading. Which yeah. Two questions. Read, 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 read. That's my <laughs> advice for reading. You should read, and then after reading, you should read some more. Mm -hmm. And then read. Uh, you can guess where this comes from as well. Yes, my favorite subject. I. <laughs> I just, I loved it so much because I was, at, at some point I was so good at it that it was just very satisfying <laughs> to do practice problems even though it didn't make any sense. You know, I wasn't studying to be an engineer. I knew I was going to uh, go to music academy. Uh, but this is when I learned this important thing to do practice problems and, and then do them again. For example, today I like doing, I mean, I look like this. I like doing crosswords. Um, I like doing Sudoku, especially if they are ridiculously, insanely difficult. Um, I find that pain to be quite um, motivating. <laughs> uh, but the thing is that the same thing happens with reading music. When you look at something 500 times, that 500 and first time will be like, fine. You know, you just read. So my advice for reading music and reading in general, read, right. read. And then you will discover how you respond to this. You need to um, uh, uh, allow yourself to be exposed to that kind of environment. Also, another sub-advice would be that you read without your instrument. And then you will see many things. You will learn a lot about yourself. Maybe some things that you wish you hadn't learned. Mm -hmm. Which I think was this quarantine for a lot of people. They learned so much. <laughs> mm -hmm. And maybe some of these things were not so pleasant. But it's okay, it's fine. So in the talking about quarantine, somebody has been only practicing scales in the lockdown. And he said, yes. If yes. you can suggest a time that should be given for any piece versus the scales. Uh, um, sorry, what, 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 what? what? Um, uh, someone <laughs> said that he's only been practicing scales during the lockdown. Yeah, good luck with that. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can suggest how long I should practice for any piece and how long you should have to practice for scales. I mean, how, how just uh, how to time allocate. Well, it, that depends on how much time you have, you know. Um, if you have all day to yourself, which I think we do now, I still wouldn't practice more than four hours because it's not necessary. Why? Because I learned, you know, 15 plus years ago, I'm so old now, uh, that you should think of a slightly larger structure, not daily. Look at weeks, look at months, you know. A year is maybe slightly too abstract. Month, okay, but think of it weekly. You know, if you practice scales for 25 hours a week, I have a headache for you. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't, it, it's, it's gonna be fine. You're gonna be great at playing scales. You're gonna be the best with 10 hours. If you feel the strong need to practice scales and only scales, do them an hour a day. But I definitely wouldn't go uh, above that. It's, it's just, it's not useful. It actually might become counterproductive and actually detrimental in the end. No injuries, no pain, no gain, only it refers to this mental aspect. Physically, no, we're not hockey players. <laughs> so, um, with them it's fine if, if they want to feel pain and then some gain that's their problem but I'm telling you even sports men and women they're trying and I see this becoming more and more popular because I follow these things 
especially in tennis and, and even team sports, people invest more time and energy into psychology coaching, into doing mental practice. Why? Because your body gets tired after a while. It just cannot take it anymore, you know? And that's where our work comes in because we're so used to it. <laughs> you know, because that's what we do every day. We use our brains in that way. Uh, we can provide some answers. How to connect this physical aspect with mental. Yeah. And no injuries. So, uh, I think uh, someone mentioned nails. Yeah. I love nails. I love nails. Okay, listen. <laughs> mm. Mm. I hate them so much. So listen, my sister, she's uh, one of the leading pediatric dermatologists in the region. So this is her area, skin and nails. Uh, our nails and everyone's nails, by extension, of course, they're not designed to play guitar. Just accept it. They are something that people cut on a daily basis. And this is what our livelihood depends on. If you just stop and think about that sentence, it will put things in a perspective. It's sad how much time <laughs> people spend their nails. Just let them be. If they grow, they will grow. If they break, not if, when they break, and they absolutely will just don't fuss with them too much. They also need some time to adjust to what you're doing to them every day. Because this is basically nail abuse, what we're doing. You know, no wonder that Tarek had just cut off his nails at the end of his life, you know, last decade. He was playing without nails. I can understand that position. I'm not going to do it. But understand, also, I don't know if you can look, see this, my nail shape. It's actually quite curved. This is years of growing and breaking. This is what will happen to you as well. It's just fine. It's always good to have plan A, B, C. So here's the thing. My plan A is this. Plan A is being lucky that nothing broke. Let's move to more realistic plan B. <laughs> if something breaks, just leave it be. Leave it alone. Don't touch it. Plan C, if you have a concert and you're missing a nail, you will have to glue one on. Um, I'm sorry, you know, it's not my fault. It's just the nature of our work. Uh, you will have to, for your plan C, simply have a couple of spare nails, as in actual fake nails, <laughs> you know, uh, and just glue them together. And that's it. That's the entire philosophy behind nails. Or plan B, you know, which is alternative plan, play without nails. And also see what happens. I spent most of my grade seven playing without nails. I, I'm still fine. <laughs> I mean, fine is a relative term. Okay, I accept that. But fine-ish, fine adjacent. Without nails, I put a year without nails. Going okay, so but, but the other question now that I... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was just going back to the, uh, to the other questions. Uh, we yes. Have, I'm going to give you a few and then I can repeat mm -hmm. the ones that you... I mean, you can pick the one that you want to ans ask, answer first and yes. we'll come back to the others. Yes. Uh, somebody has asked how long it took you to master Rosita. <laughs> Oh, that's an excellent question. Uh, yes, <laughs> I love it. It's my favorite question so far. Um, I, re I remember reading it when I was 14. And then, and that's it. I just read it. Um, you know, I didn't play it. And I, I liked the piece, but I had so many other things. I decided not to put it in my program. And then in this crazy year, yes, that's when I started playing it in the crazy junior year. <laughs> um, I played it, I think I practiced it half an hour every other day and it was done in two weeks. But like I was ready for recording. Mm. But mind you, I've been playing guitar for eight years by that point when I was 16. So, I had plenty of Legos lined, piled up already. Um, I love Legos. They're my favorite uh, studying analogy. Um, 
I hope this answers the question, but please yeah. like don't get discouraged easily. I know that's a big challenge when you're working on something new. There's always previous knowledge to build on. Definitely. You know, please don't get discouraged. And um, to keep things simple, two plus two. No, no quadratic equations. Two plus two. Well, and then later. We looked at um, the ana harmonic analysis of a piece. Yes. So how much does it actually help in um, learning the piece and the interpretation of it? Listen, listen, all of you that you are still here. It's engraved in my mind. I don't know if you find that attractive or not. It's up to you. It's cemented. That's how much it helps. Like, there's no chance in hell I'm going to forget how Rosita goes when I'm playing a concert or, or any piece. <laughs> uh, this is the problem that I had with my music teachers, specifically guitar professors. They just couldn't understand because they weren't the best in math in high school. Uh, they just couldn't understand what it, uh, they think my memory is like an Amazon package that I received and then I opened it and that was it. No. Sure, I maybe have slightly above average uh, skills in memory. Fine, you know, but it, it's mostly average. I worked on it, you know, and, and these are the techniques that I used in order to improve my memory. And this is one example of active learning, you know, not just road memorization, just highlighting things or, you know, copying other people's math homework. It ain't gonna help people. Uh, active learning, active. It's gonna be a mess in the beginning. It's gonna feel uncomfortable because it's not pleasant at first. But the more you do it, the more you will become familiar with that feeling and it will help tremendously. So don't belong in, in that group with my guitar teachers. They're really good people, but they just don't understand memory, how it works, you know. This is how I worked on it. I created this onion layers, <laughs> basically. And uh, th this is how I, now I work on every piece. How did you um, manage nervousness? And do you have any advice for, you know, no, like that. Yeah. I, I managed it like that by by really studying my thinking, the, the way I learn. That that was the most important thing. I was I mean you can tell for me I was a bit cheeky and naughty with an N-O-D-D-Y towards some of my teachers. It's, it's still in high school as well. One of my teachers would say, breathe. And I was looking at him like, what? Like, girl, calm down. Calm down. <laughs> like it, it's fine I got this why because breathing doesn't help if you haven't done your practicing properly when you have I don't know when you have an English exam uh, it's not gonna help if you breathe in and out if you haven't gone through your like parts past participles or your articles or something if you haven't actually gone through the material it's not gonna help so this is my number one advice to actually go through the actual work <laughs> uh, many times <laughs> uh, but of course keeping in mind that one day is not the end you know always look at the bigger picture this will help immensely when you're performing because it will just it will feel so secure it that will almost be uncomfortable how comfortable you feel with something mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, and this also helps with, with other things, other subjects, other tests. This is what, where music helped the other school. I, I thought of these exams and tests as a performance. And when I looked at it that way, it helped me prepare. For example, when I was studying history, I had a really tough professor. He was, I mean, uh, uh, strict but fair. You know, I cannot say that he was a mean person or anything, but very demanding. Um, and I simply, I didn't have time. I was interested in that subject, but when there wasn't enough hours <laughs> in, a, in a week to do all that work. So I would actually pick a page or a passage, not more than two pages, 
I would read that once, but deliberately. Here is how I would read it. I would read it knowing that when I close the textbook, I would actually have to write notes based on what I read. That's a horrifying feeling at first. I can, you know, trust me, if you haven't done this before, it really is. Because you feel so uncomfortable and so out of your comfort zone. <laughs> um, but the great thing is that it really makes you think and work uh, and make your brain work over time. I would learn more than other people in like days, in, in like half an hour. Not because I have exceptional memory, but because I worked on it. I, I always work on connecting information. And that's where music helped, you know, regular school. <laughs> I mean, this is an actual regular school without bunny ears. It's, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, so now two more questions and then I think we're done. So one, someone has asked how many pieces do you recommend practicing in one day? At and the same time. Mm -hmm. Too much can be confusing. Yes, three. Like that's an actual number. Three different pieces. Everything else, it's going to be a mess. And then also designate two or three days in a week. Preferably two. Three is a kind of pushing it, but okay. Let's say a Wednesday and a Sunday. Where you're going to go through them as a performance. And also record some of it. It's good to have like actual physical material that you can later kind of reflect on. And you know, it's also a nice memory. Mm. But in, in terms of like actual volume, three, three pieces. If we are talking about two, three, four minute pieces, like at most 10 to 15 minutes of music. Yeah. Everything else is kind of already pushing it. Okay, okay. the last one is about a technique. Can you show us how to do the dampening technique? Uh, which one? The... Ooh. If Anish is here, can you which dampening technique? I dampen string the strings with uh, several different techniques. I use my left hand. So for example, when you're playing, you can see it. I'm gonna play a C and an E. Yeah. <laughs> you cannot escape broken out of the bodies. They're, they're also everywhere, similar like scales. And also right hand. Um, I forgot to mention that in, my, um, uh, in the first part of the lecture, to make things a bit more difficult, do things staccato. It's actually more difficult than just leaving things ready. It just Short movements, nothing crazy. Be precise, slow tempo, steady, all of the key words apply. And always listen. Actually listen to what you're doing. You, you are a great judge of your skills, if you're going to be honest to yourself. <laughs> oh, OK, there are so many. OK. Mm -hmm. No, that's it. I think we're done. I've asked you everything from the list. I'm just look, look, uh, looking at some of the... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, uh, someone mentioned the, these contractions. Please, no. No, no. <laughs> and music history is riddled with injuries based on these mechanical contractions for fingers. No, no. I, I wouldn't recommend that. If you feel comfortable using them, fine, but that is completely up to you, no. At most, I would use those stress balls just to kind of keep your fingers and hands busy. I don't know if you use them. How are they called? You know? These kind of stress balls that you can... <laughs> I forget the name, but 
if they yeah, don't exactly. know mm -hmm. what we're talking about. If you're gonna do something, then, then do this to kind of strengthen your fingers. But trust me, the best way to strengthen your fingers is just to do these exercises deliberately, not like, oh, whatever. And it will be, I, I think, the best way, the best way to do things. Again, unfortunately, every day, I cannot help you with that. <laughs> like there's some like secret passage, you know, like in Super Mario where you can skip levels. No. Mm. It doesn't, unfortunately, it really doesn't work like that. Um, so it, it will take some time, but I promise you, it, it will be worth it. It really will. Okay. I believe in your capabilities. Yay! <laughs> okay. That was, I think... Is, is, is that it for... I mean, we covered plenty of ground. <laughs> <laughs> get this. Um, so yeah, I hope this will be inspiring to people. It will give you some ideas you know, has, and I've on, been, on how to work. I've been getting messages from some people who had to, uh, who had other commitments and they've had to sign up. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've been messaging to say, I mean, I've got a few already that have said this has already been very, very impactful. And the personal anecdotes are things that make it more relatable and make it more inspirational. I'm super relatable. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, it's like, what? <laughs> no, uh, because I, I kind of love that period uh, uh, because some of, so many things really stuck with me. And I have so many really nice memories, you know, and, and they, they weren't all great. Of course, I didn't get along with everyone in my school. I hated most of the people in my music school, which is fine because they hated me. Fine, it worked both ways. Um, and I actually didn't appreciate some of my teachers. I thought that their teaching techniques were too abrasive. Uh, so it wasn't all great. And I had many ups and downs. A lot of times I like, didn't want to go out of my bed. I was just tired and exhausted. But for the most part, and I really mean like above 90%, it was um, very enjoyable and, and I really learned so much. Um, I, I would definitely encourage other people to do a similar thing, you know, maybe not the same, but like really make that extra effort and that investment, you know, in their education. Yeah. Okay, so let you know, if you're up for this, we'd love to have you again. And whenever you're free, please let me know and we can do something else. Of course, I have a lot of different topics. I think um, yeah. that the reading, reading strategies, that's a def definitely a separate lecture. Also memory, how to become a memory master. Um, I have a lot of really useful tips, some of that I haven't mentioned today, um, and yeah. yeah, guitar things, music things. Yeah. And everybody here, I'll quick, uh, you know, for the next few minutes, I'm just unmuting everyone and um, don't worry, I'll send an email out tonight with the sheet music that we discussed, the PDF that you saw on Srijan's screen and his email address. So you can, you can get, you know, all your fan mail later. Yes. Okay. So I, I, I'm going to go. <laughs> it was a, a real pleasure for me. Absolutely. Uh, and I hope to see you again soon. Yeah. See you soon. Thank, thank you very much for the session. Thank you very much for the session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.